on Linux, GNU is the primary provider of the Unix-like utils. In the GNU context, these are referred to as the core utils. Things like cat, ls, rm, makedir, echo, and things like that. More generically, you could refer to these as the POSIX utils. But even on Linux, GNU is by no means the only implementation available. You also have things like BusyBox, Plan 9, Ninebase, let alone all of the BSD implementations that exist, and the decades upon decades of Unix implementations for various different Unix systems. And there's one such implementation that I've been checking in on every so often, that being UUtils, which is a Rust rewrite of specifically the GNU core utils. I say the GNU core utils and not POSIX because the GNU implementation does have some extensions over that baseline POSIX. And before someone says, isn't this just the Rust rewrite meme where the rabid Rust fans will want to rewrite every single application into Rust? You can certainly make that argument, except for the fact that this project has been a work in progress for a very, very long time. So the first time this was posted over on Hacker News was all the way back in November 29 of 2013. There have been a bunch of posts on Hacker News since that point, one in 2014, one in 2016, which I happen to have lost the link to, and then one earlier this year in early 2022. This literally existed before Rust 1.0. This was being developed before Rust was a standardized language in 2015. All the way back in 2013, maybe like a handful of people knew about Rust. It was nothing like it was today. Now you might be asking, well, what exactly is the point of making a Rust rewrite of the GNU core utils? Why not just use the GNU core utils because they're already the GNU core utils? Well, one of the main goals of this project is attempting to create a universal set of cross-platform tools. So not only operating as a drop and replacement for the GNU tools on modern x86 64-bit Linux, but also operating on all of these other systems, whether that's, you know, Linux on ARM or Linux on PowerPC, or you know what, how about some Windows? Or how about some macOS? Or how about FreeBSD or NetBSD? What about Android? And if those aren't good enough, why don't we start working on things like Solaris and Redox and Fuchsia? Now, for these ones down the bottom here, these are still very much work in progress. Anything that has a Y in there, that tool is currently working. As you can see, there are currently no Ys. So this is a future thing, but as for things like Linux, Windows, Mac OS, FreeBSD, NetBSD, and Android, all of those are coming along pretty well. Now, this has been making a lot of progress over the years. So this table isn't 100% up to date, but basically demonstrates the work that still needs to be done. Anything on the left-hand side, this is things that at least seem to be completed. There may be some things that still need to be worked on, but from what they can see, it basically does what it needs to be doing. Anything in the middle, these are things that still need to be worked on, and then anything on the right-hand side basically hasn't been started. Now, this post here is going to send you to a couple of bugs that still need to be worked on. This isn't everything that still needs to be done. There are plenty of open issues still available. As you can see, there's 160 issues, 24 pull requests, and there's probably, you know, plenty of other things that still need to be worked on that haven't been discovered yet. Some things like some options can be added slash removed in the GNU implementation, some error management might be missing, and some behaviors might be different from what they should be. A better way to demonstrate this progress though is with a picture of the test suite. So the way they test this is running this against the GNU test suite, the test suite that GNU uses to make sure that their core utils operate like their core utils. And a very important switch happened earlier this year, the switch between the fail and the pass rate. Now, more tests are passing than tests that are failing. But I think an even better demonstration is what it's like in the real world. So right now, UUtils is actually packaged 
over on Debian. You can install it right now and actually start using it. And this guy running a blog actually went and did so and, you know, tested it out and see what it was actually going to be like. Really good blog post. I really recommend you go and read it. But the TLDR is that Rust Core Utils is now available in Debian. It is good enough to boot Debian with GNOME and install the top thousand packages, build Firefox, build the Linux kernel, and LLVM slash Clang. But even if I wrote more than a hundred patches, it will still be a bumpy ride for many other use cases. But to be fair, that covers a lot of use cases. If you're just living in a standard graphical environment, you can get pretty far using these utils. Also keeping in mind, this blog post was written a year ago, so it's gotten a lot better since then. A year ago, we were somewhere in this stage where a lot of the tests were still failing. But before you get your hopes up, repeat after me. This is not production ready. If you couldn't tell by the fact that, you know, some tools like STTY were completely missing, and the fact that tools that you expect to basically just be working like CP, DD, LS, printf, and test may not work like they should be, you wouldn't want to run this in anything where you actually want it to be stable. And doing well on the suite is a good indication that things are going really, really well. But test suites are generally not perfect, and there's probably going to be a lot of edge cases which are not being covered. And hopefully the way the test suite is set up is going to cover the general use cases that most people are going to be doing. But things tend to break when you do things out of the box. Also, this is basically just considering the Linux version, which right now is by far the best version. Scrolling across this list, you can see that pretty much everything is good good to go. But on something like Windows MSVC, for example, there are things in here like Chamod, Chiroot, uh, Change Group, for example, which don't work as expected. And on other systems, it's a bit more hit and miss about what is going to be good. And because they are trying to support these other operating systems, they can't just rely on only on the GNU test suite. The GNU suite does offer a lot of existing coverage, but it's not going to address things like edge cases that might exist on macOS or FreeBSD or on Windows. So to make sure those are being covered, they are writing their own tests alongside the GNU test as well, but also for Linux as well. So the GNU test suite might not cover every single case, and there might be cases where you can actually make the tool operate more consistently than the GNU counterpart otherwise would. But I don't know if that's actually a good thing to do. Obviously, dealing with memory leaks and crashes and things like that, always a good idea to deal with. But if you're getting an output that doesn't exactly line up with the way that it should be outputting, but that's the way it's always happened on the GNU side, is it best to just leave that output as it is, or to address it and make the tool better, even though it may make some things not operate like they should? I don't know what the best approach there is. I think if you're aiming for full compatibility, though, it's probably best to make it scuffed in the areas where it doesn't matter if it's scuffed, but the output is important. All of that being said, while it's not ready for a production system, when it comes to like a secondary install or a hobby system, it's good enough to at least play with. Now there is one thing that sort of plagued this project since the day that it first started. It's not the fact that it's written in Rust, it is the license for the project. So the way it's licensed is as an MIT project not a GPL v3 project like the GNU core utils. And on any of the Hacker News posts about this to get even remotely popular, generally at least 50% or so of the comments are arguing about whether licensing it as MIT was actually a good idea. And the reason why people care so much about this is due to the function of a GPL style license. So these licenses have something known as copyleft, which for the lack of a better descriptor is basically a license virus. 
So anything derived from like, let's say GPL V3, that must also be GPL V3 or a GPL V3 compatible license. Now, if you were to go and take that GPL V3 code and then put it into another project, that entire project must be licensed under a GPL V3 compatible license. This is what I mean by a licensed virus. Basically, anything it gets involved with is infected by GPL. But this only works in one direction. So if you have something like MIT license code, for example, which you can take proprietary and do basically whatever you want with it, if you bring that into a GPL v3 project, that code then doesn't have to be GPL v3. But if you go in the other direction and take GPL v3 code and put it into an MIT project, the entire MIT project must either be GPL v3 or a GPL compatible license. And by using a GPL style license, it then becomes free software and all of the regular free software restrictions are applied to that code, which you may like or you may not, depending on the context that you are working in. And the argument basically boils down to if you take a GPL project like the GNU Core Utils and then you re-implement it in an MIT license, are you deriving code from the GPL project and violating the license by licensing it as MIT. I don't have a set answer for that, but it's certainly worth discussing. So if we were to look at a GPL style project and then re-implement it with a MIT license, that doesn't inherently mean that the code that you've written is a derivative of that GPL project. This is something that must be argued in court, but if you did look at the code, it does remove your ability to use that defense. And considering how simple a lot of these tools are, things like CP, RM, MakeDir, Echo, and things like that, it's hard to argue that they are substantial enough to actually be copyrightable. If there's only one or two efficient ways to actually do something, everybody's going to instantly write that approach without even having to consider the existing code. There's also the issue that the GNU tools aren't originals either. All they are are re-implementations of existing proprietary tools. And finally, Rust and C are so different in the way you actually write them that by writing idiomatic Rust code, there's no way to effectively copy what was done in something written in C. But if the FSF ever got annoyed with them, this is a discussion that would have to happen between their lawyers and just work out what exactly is going on. I think they'd probably be fine, but as I've said in previous videos, I am not a lawyer. What I do know though, is I am very curious to see how these tools turn out in the future, and if there ever comes a point where we can actually effectively run them on a production system. I think that would be really, really cool. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Did you know about UU tools? Have you tried them out before? What do you just generally think of them? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. If you really like the video and want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, and bear pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Optimum Plays. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.